You may have heard that the shortest path between two points is a straight line. Geometrically, this is true. However, what if we're trying to find the fastest path between two points? What if we're talking about the shortest path between two points in time? This will lead us to some interesting ideas and to one of the trickiest questions that Richard Feynman asked one of Einstein's assistants. <laughs> Imagine we want to roll a ball down a hill, but we get to design the hill in order to make the ball reach its destination as fast as possible. This is the brachistochrone problem, and I'll leave links to other videos about it, but the result is this curve called a cycloid. This is the perfect balance to use the ball's vertical acceleration over the distance it needs to travel. So even though the shortest distance is the straight line, it's not the quickest path. Now in this case, and in day-to-day -day life, if we want to get somewhere fast, we only think about changing our distance. Time will advance no matter what, and it's out of our control. We can't just slow down time so we can get somewhere on time. Or can we? Einstein came across what we know as relativity, and some strange things can happen. For example, we've learned that a moving clock actually runs slower than a stationary clock. Here we have a clock in this rocket ship just floating out in space, but once we start up the engines, and now it has some velocity, the clock actually slows down. It would need to be moving pretty fast for the effect to be this noticeable, but it does occur even at low speeds despite it not being quite as obvious. Something similar happens in a gravitational field. To start, we see gravity as an acceleration, and its acceleration is indistinguishable from if we were on a spaceship and it started speeding up. The mass of an object can bend space-time, which causes what we perceive as the acceleration. But the farther away you are from the object, that acceleration decreases. So, we're used to our clocks running at some rate here on the Earth's surface, but the higher up we go, the less acceleration we experience, and the clocks actually run faster. If you've seen the film Interstellar, this is what happens when they're close to the black hole, which is significantly more massive than the Earth, so more acceleration. And when minutes are passing for the main characters that are near the black hole, Years are passing for people further away back on the Earth. Alright, now we have all the tools we need to understand Feynman's question. Richard Feynman, if you're not familiar, was a brilliant physicist who won a Nobel Prize. He was also a curious character, and he loved to ask questions that challenged conventional thinking. While working on his PhD at Princeton, he was talking to one of Einstein's assistants, who was working a lot with relativity. This is what Feynman asked him. You blast off in a rocket which has a clock on board, and there's a clock on the ground. The idea is you have to be back when the clock on the ground says one hour has passed. Now you want it so that when you come back, your clock is as far ahead as possible. According to Einstein, if you go very high, your clock will go faster, because the higher something is in a gravitational field, the faster its clock goes. But if you try to go too high, since you've only got an hour, you have to go so fast to get there that the speed slows your clock down. So you can't go too high. The question is exactly what program of speed and height should you make so that you get the maximum time on your clock. It took the assistant some time to realize that it was essentially a trick question. The solution is that you want the rocket to take the same path as if it were simply tossed up into the air and allowed to free fall back to the surface. The curve makes sense when you think about it. We want to go faster when we're close to the Earth, which slows down our clock, 
and spending less time near the Earth. Then we want to go slowest when we're high above the Earth, and the clock is going fastest, spending more time there. This path is actually just a straight line, but through curved space-time. In other words, we want the rocket to take the natural motion of matter in a gravitational field, with no artificial slowing down or speeding up from the rocket boosters. Let's go back to this picture with point A and point B, but let's add some axes. So now the horizontal direction represents time instead of space. Taking a straight line between these two points represents a constant speed, and it's actually the minimum effort needed to travel between these two points in flat space-time. What we've learned, though, is the faster you travel, the slower your clock goes. Even though point B is fixed in time from this perspective, we can actually arrive there in a shorter time according to our clocks uh, than the horizontal separation we see here. To do that, uh, let's do the maximum amount of effort and move around as much as we can between the two points in order to slow down our clock. The more we move, and essentially avoid the actual location of B in space, the quicker we will get there according to our clock. So if you're trying to get from point A to point B, that zigzag line will get you there quicker than the straight line. A straight line through space-time not only isn't the shortest path, it's actually the longest path. So, this is the case for something moving through flat space-time, but you may recall what I said about massive objects bending space-time. And approaching from that perspective of space-time curvature, we can see that if something is moving in a straight line at constant velocity, it gets redirected based on the curvature. Now, this is the motion of matter moving through a gravitational field, and exactly what happens if we just toss something up into the air and let it come back down to the Earth's surface. And that's what our rocket does as well. Um, so you can picture it kind of like rolling a ball up a hill and then it rolls back down. Uh, but as far as that object is concerned, it's really just going in a straight line and it's space-time that's curved. It's not some mysterious coincidence that this straight line through curved space-time path gives us the largest time difference for our rocket. It's actually the other way around, and that's what makes Feynman's question essentially a trick question. The time difference is why objects move the way that they do. It's mostly the curvature of time near the Earth that causes the motion of matter that we see, and the gravitational acceleration we experience. This is where general relativity comes from. As we go higher above the Earth's surface, our clocks aren't going faster because we experience weaker gravity. Rather, we experience weaker gravity because time runs faster 